This is why no one does tax reform. This is why it's, it's impossible, because somebody's ox is going to get gored. Only somebody from Fairview would say, ox getting gored. Please welcome Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox to stage. And to be clear, um, we, we all know that this guy is actually running for governor, um, and he's a candidate for that, but he is not here in that capacity. He's actually here in his capacity as Lieutenant Governor. Um, and so keep in mind that as we go through this discussion. Uh, this past session, there was a, you know, this, this tax reform overhaul bill that you know, was being pushed through the House, ultimately stalled out, um, and you know, the idea was, you know, hey, we're gonna go around, do some town halls, um, which they've done, and they, they did a town hall here, the, the speaker and the, and the Senate president, and you know, hear, heard, heard feedback, that type of thing. There, there's talk of potentially maybe a special session. I'm not sure if that's likely or not. Um, what was your, and, and again, this is an interesting position for you to be in because you're, you're a candidate, but you're also the sitting lieutenant governor. So what was your thought on the bill that was being pushed and what we do from here now that that bill is no longer even on the table? Well, I, I appreciate the, uh, the the precursor because um, I, I am the lieutenant governor, and today I'm I'm appearing as the lieutenant governor, and and so that is a, that is a very important caveat. Uh, the way we fund government um, through taxes, there are several buckets. The two biggest buckets and the two most important are um, income tax and uh, and sales tax. Um, income tax in Utah is uh, is devoted 100% earmarked. We're the only state that does this. 100% earmarked to education. So that bucket goes directly to education. That's been the the healthiest performing uh, bucket of of funds for government taxes. What we've seen is the, the, the income tax fund is, is really surging. When you hear we have a, um, a $100 million surplus um, coming up, that's all, almost all in the, the income tax fund. That's, that's education. Um, and the, the sales tax fund has remained fairly steady. It, it is growing, just not growing at the rate that the, that the other one is. We are also the fastest growing state in the nation over the past decade, and that's, that's really important. Since 2010, we've added 450,000 people somewhere in there. Um, we're really good at having kids. Um, we do it better than anywhere else, uh, but we, we've also had an increase in, in migration. So um, we've been eighth or ninth for in migration over the last couple years. People are coming to Utah. We're seeing it, right? Seeing it here at Silicon Slopes. In fact, Silicon Slopes is one of the big drivers for, for that increase. And so, so now we find ourselves, uh, what, what happens is the legislature decides where the money gets spent. That's their job. Um, but their hands are tied a little bit because of the way that these buckets work. Now, they found a way around that over the past, uh, over the past couple decades. And the way they found around that is um, higher education used to be only in the general fund, which is sales tax. And in the 90s, we voted as a people to change the Constitution to allow higher education into the income tax or education fund bucket. And so the way, since they couldn't use any of that bucket for roads and, and the other things that need to be done, they've, they've, what they've done is every year, if they need a, you know, $50 million in the general fund, because it's not growing as fast as the other one, they would move $50 million of higher education over into the education fund, and that would give them $50 million to spend on roads, prison, highway patrol, all the other things that we do. Um, and so th that's what's been happening. The problem now is that almost all of higher ed is in the education bucket. So they can't do that anymore over, you know, in a year or two, probably, that's what it looks like. We won't be able to do that anymore. So now their hands are tied. So now we have lots of money in education, which is really good for education, which is what education people have been saying all along. We need that. Instead of just giving more of it to higher ed, now we get it for K through 12. Um, and, uh, but if you like roads and uh, if you've, try to get on the freeway out here at any time, we need more money for roads. So in their wisdom, the legislature thought, and, and the governor uh, pushed really hard for this, we've got to do something, or we're gonna find ourselves in, uh, at a cliff where we can't keep up with our roads and we'll be in trouble and, and other things. And so this, this was the, the idea that came out of that. So the first one was, the first problem with it was um, process. Um, the, the process was not good. The bill did not come out until very late in the session. Um, 
Most people had no idea what was in the bill. Um, there was some misunderstandings about things that were in the bill, and then there were some understandings about things that were in the bill that, that were not great. And uh, it was just it was just incredibly problematic. Um, it didn't have the time to get the buy-in from people. And and this idea that we'll, we'll just shove it through and it'll be fine, a terrible idea. And that's you and I started talking about that. We didn't have all the people at the table. We didn't have the right people at the table. In fact, we didn't have you guys at the table, which was a huge mistake. And I I had those conversations as well and so so that was a big one and then and then again the substance of the bill was was very problematic certain things that had not been thought through um, and 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 just more broadly this this concept of taxing all services while while lowering the rate and broadening the base is a very conservative tax principle and it's a good one um, the the idea of taxing services wholesale and being really the only state to do that is also a bad idea we lose our competitive edge um, compared to other states which which matters. One of the reasons we're being so successful is we do have good tax policy. And, uh, and, and so that, that was problematic as well. What happens, unfortunately, with taxes is as you set tax policy and things are moving in a good direction, People with very good lobbyists and uh, um, very compelling stories come out and, and convince the legislature that their piece of that should not be taxed. They probably have a great story and, it, and, and, and that happens. So we take, we, we eliminate them and over time you get this Swiss cheese because this group and this group gets pulled out and this group gets pulled out and this group pulls out. And then all of a sudden you've got pressure to raise raise taxes. We have a lot of loopholes that don't make sense, um, where we're taxing some car washes but not others. Um, one, one very interesting one, we tax taxis but not Uber or Lyft doing this, the same types of things. So there, there definitely are some loopholes where logic doesn't fit and, and where some fixes I think could and should be made. It's really weird what breaks through the public consciousness with this stuff. Um, we're around it so much that we forget that we're not normal in any way because um, we, we, you know, we read everything and we know what's going on. I call it my, my mom test, like what, what is she paying attention to because she doesn't like politics and she doesn't care about this stuff and and as I travel around the state um, the questions I get asked what breaks through are really interesting one is the inland port it's broken through like you'll be in a little town out in the middle of you know Box Elder County or, or Emory County and someone will ask you about the inland port and it's not that they don't like it it's that they're very confused by it. They, they, they don't get it. They don't know why someone would chain themselves to a desk over what, they're very confused and they wanna know about the inland port. Um, and the second one is this, it's taxes. This, this broke through. And the problem uh, being a legislator and, and having been there is you get this kind of bunker mentality, those 45 days of the session, you're just trapped up there and you're in this bubble and you don't know what's real and what's going out in the rest of the world and you kind of wander out on day 46 and the sun's really bright and you're, you're disoriented. And then, and then your neighbors start talking to you and you're like, oh, wow, okay. So this was really, really a bad idea. Well, I think that's why, kind of probably why as you're traveling around, it's broken through, right? Because just it's jarring to hear, hey, number one economy in the country, billion dollar surplus, and then 10 days before the session, the sky's falling. We need to change drastically how we collect taxes from everyone, right? That's probably why it's broken through. It's because those two messages don't align. And with uh, an amendment, which we're the only state um, in the country to have, where all income tax goes to education, that's the problem. Well, it's not, it's not the problem, but that's like an issue here because that billion dollar surplus is over there. Is that correct? I wish it was a billion, but yes. Whatever yeah, it is. Yeah. Whatever this Less than is. a billion, but yeah, it's, it's over there. We're yeah. Silicon Slopes. We say billion. <laughs> um, and then, so, do you think there's any political capital or will to, um, you know, get rid of that constitutional amendment? Do you even think that's a good idea? So I do think that there, I do think it's, it will be part of the discussion, for sure. Yeah, there's, there's no question that will be part of the discussion. You talked about conflicting messages. Well, one of the conflicting messages is we never have enough money for education, and now you're going to ask us to take money away from education. What, what, what people don't realize is that the legislature has been doing that anyway, right? But they've just been doing it in a... In a 
sliding manner so that people don't realize that. And so now you have the possibility of having hundreds of millions of dollars that, um, that has to be spent on education, can't be spent anywhere else, um, and they've never had to deal with that before. And so I, I think it will be hard, even if the legislature, and even if it's the best thing on paper, how, how do you convince the people of Utah who say their number one priority is more money for education that you think we shouldn't have an earmark for education? And so I think that's, that's really problematic. But the, the opposite side of that is, if we took that away, it really wouldn't be any different than what we have now. While, while yes, they did have to spend it on either higher ed or, or um, K-12, they were basically just deciding how all the money was spent anyway. And, and uh, um, we, the good news is we have been putting more and more money in education. We put over a billion dollars in over the last four years, which is awesome. Um, and uh, teachers are getting paid more than ever. We have three districts now that are going to start at $50,000, which is a, a really big deal. Um, but we look, we have some natural issues on education. I meant mentioned we're the fastest growing state. Our birth rate is always number one or two. Um, and, uh, and our and the federal government owns almost 70% of our state. Whether you think that's a great idea or a bad idea, um, it's, it's a thing. Um, most, uh, most education funding comes out of property taxes. When you go to other states, it's property taxes. And when you have more kids per capita than anywhere else in the country and you can't tax 70% of your land, you're gonna have the lowest funding per pupil in the country. We could double, double our taxes. If you wanna double your income taxes right now, double them, okay? I'm sure that would be great for business, right? Double our income taxes right now, we would move all the way from 50th to like 36th or 37th in per pupil funding. So look, that's just the reality. If we're gonna, if we're not, if we're gonna let the federal government own 70% of our state, for better or worse, we're not going to be able to pay for our kids' education like every other state does. And, uh, and if we're going to have a lot of kids, which, which is a good thing, um, th this, is, this is just where we are. So these, these are the pressures that we have that you don't get in other states. I want to talk to you about incentives. This is an interesting conversation for, for our community uh, because, you know, uh, the way incentives are currently working or have been working or at least what the perception is of the way they're working has been like, hey, the um, governor's office is giving incentives to outside companies to um, come move here, get better tax breaks than homegrown companies and compete with us on talent and just generally, right? And incentives is an interesting conversation for us in, in general, because I think uh, folks on Capitol Hill just think, you know, we're, we love incentives, when in fact we would love no incentives. But just give us your overall take and thoughts on incentives now. Yeah, no, thank you, Clint. And, and by the way, um, I'm pleased to report that this is something that the legislature is reconsidering, and, and so I'm excited about that. Um, by the way, I share your passion for no incentives. Um, I believe that, uh, that we would be uh, much better off if, if incentives were eliminated completely. Um, if you're a free market person, <laughs> then, then we should let the markets work, and, and I am, and, and I believe that the markets are much more effective in this. Um, the the, the the counter argument to that, which does have some merit, is as long as all the other states have incentive, then we're at a competitive disadvantage. And so we're, we're just trying to level the playing field in a way. But all of that being said, I still believe fewer incentives are better. We are not the same state we were before. We're not the same state economically, and we're not the same state um, as, as perception, people's perception outside of here. Now, there's still a lot of misperceptions out there. There's no question. I, I know it's still sometimes hard to get talent to move in here, but we have the respect of the, uh, of the rest of the world in a way we've never had it before. I get to see that. I'm, I also serve as the Secretary of State. We have a trade delegations that come from other countries uh, every other week, and it's remarkable. They're coming to Utah because we do have the best economy in the country over the past 10 years, and we're getting noticed in ways we've never been noticed before. And of course, we, it seems like every week there's a publication that comes out that talks about Silicon Slopes or, or something else that's happening. And, and so people want to be here. They really do. And the, the first problem with incentives is it's, it's impossible to know who would come regardless of the incentive. 
incentive. I mean, we try, and, and in fact, in statute, we're not supposed to give away incentives to companies that are going to come anyway. But again, if you're a company out there and you're looking to come here anyway, you're going to play the game, right? You're going to ask the right questions and say the right things for the same reason that people here want those incentives, because they're available. And in fact, you would be derelict in your duty um, to, to not get the incentive. And so, so that's, that's the first thing. We know they're coming anyway. The second thing is we have a real talent shortage here in the state of Utah. And this is a, this is a huge deal. I am as proud of anyone of having uh, unemployment at 2.8%. Um, we've been under 4.8%. Four point uh, under unemployment, four uh, percent unemployment for five and a half years now, which is by most metrics the longest period of prosperity in our state's history. It's remarkable, but uh, again, most economists would tell you that's full employment under four percent. And and so when we have thousands of jobs that are going unfilled right now, not by, by the way, not just in in the uh, in the tech sector, um, but in in many others as well, in finance and others, there, there's a hard time finding talent for these jobs. Why on earth would we be giving away tax dollars, even if it's post performance, uh, which is again better than most states? We're not writing out checks to people um, to come here. They have to come, they have to perform, they have to meet certain metrics that they agree to uh, before they get those. But but why on earth would we give away any tax money um, when uh, when when they're going to struggle to fill these jobs when they get here. Instead of giving them taxes back, um, we should be much more innovative. And this is something that you've talked about, and it's something I've shared a lot with people. Um, letting them pick where they want their incentive to be used. They don't get it back to, to, to line their pockets. They're successful. They're fine. Um, but what they could do is say, I want it to go to expand tracks into the area where we are, to expand bus service. Or I want it to go to uh, uh, workforce development. I, I want it to go you know, to our, our community colleges to help develop people for, for the jobs that we need. Um, if we're going to do something, let's, let's do it that way. It's a way to give back targeted um, that makes them feel better about things and 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 helps helps will help them in the future and help improve the ecosystem. Um, are you guys familiar with the the, the sandbox uh, idea generally? So ba basically, what this is, um, uh, I think Arizona uh, did this, and, and we looked very carefully at what what they were doing. Uh, this came out of the the legislature this year, but it's a, it's a regulatory sandbox. It's the the idea is that for new companies that are being formed, um, really in the fintech I think area more. Than than, than just about anything else, that we would relax some of the regulatory um, requirements around them to allow them an opportunity to grow uh, before they had to uh, meet some of these regulatory um, impacts. We're, we're very interested and, and very intrigued. We're, we're hoping that, uh, that we'll see um, success. We have a very large financial sector here in the state of Utah. The fintech sector is absolutely growing, and uh, I, I, I will tell you, both the governor and I, anytime we can look at relaxing or removing regulations uh, to, to encourage entrepreneurship, um, I, I believe that we have, we, we did a good job. The governor, to his credit, our team, uh, we rolled back over 350 um, regulations uh, five years ago, six years ago, and, uh, and I think it's time to look at that again. Um, the regulatory creep is a real thing, and uh, while some of them made sense 40 years ago, they don't make as much sense now. And so this sandbox idea is a great way to, to experiment, to allow people to participate, and, uh, and, then, and then hopefully grow some businesses. Please give it up for Lieutenant Governor Spencer Cox for spending Thank the hour guys. with us.